Uh, a lot of faces here, uh, and then new faces. Uh, as you know, we're expanding not just at the pillar level, but at the general level as well. And, it's, and again, Jason's not here today. We are booming and in fuego. Uh, how many times have you heard that being said uh, at the chamber? Um, with that in mind, I, I, I also want to mirror Jerry's point about the pillar membership um, and investment in time and effort in the chamber. It is really being just that an investment. Why so? Because we we have the pulse of what's happening in Miami Beach as well as basically up throughout South Florida. And for example, we're, we have the Gaming Commission, where uh, or the gaming issue, where we have our own little uh, uh, panel that's uh, keeping track of what's going on with respect to, to gaming and uh, a lot of other issues that we're tackling as a chamber as well. For example, Memorial Day weekend. How does that impact Miami Beach? So um, I just want to say, with your continued input and the leadership that we have with uh, everybody from Jerry to Jason to Alan Lips um, to our vice chairs, uh, pillar vice chairs, uh, Michael Grieco and I'll see Dan Graham, uh, we're going to continue to do just that, stay in Fuego. So with that, I'd also like to introduce, uh, he's a dynamic speaker. I think a lot of you know Mr. Bruce Dukel. Don't come up yet. I just want to say a few words about him. Uh, Bruce uh, is a very dynamic speaker in the area of advertising, marketing, and branding. He's spoken all over the uh, United States at Harvard, MIT, uh, etc. He's worked for such dynamic companies as uh, Nike, um, Baptist Health, also the Discovery Channel. Um, he's appeared on uh, NPR, CNN. Fox News, um, and he's also written books about marketing and advertising. Uh, his last one, uh, Building Brand Value. Uh, I think I got that right, Bruce. Is that correct? Building, there you go. So, uh, having said that, and uh, I'd like to, for everybody to give a warm introduction to Mr. Bruce Turkel. It dawned on me that Miami Beach is not a city, 
It's not a place. Miami Beach is a concept. Because if I asked you each to describe it, you could tell me about it, you could tell me what's here, but you couldn't really tell me what it is because it's not a bunch of hotels or a bunch of homes or a beach or an island. Miami Beach is a concept. Think about how, how it started. First of all, Miami Beach wasn't a concept, it was a swamp. Way, way back. We're talking, you know, 150 years ago. Because Miami actually wasn't even a city. The first people who lived here lived on Elliott Key. Those of you who are scuba divers or boaters have been to Elliott Key. And it's hard to believe that 250 people actually lived there, but they did. They, it was a uh, pineapple plantation, and they were salvagers because the big city was Key West, and all these boats were going to Key West, and they would wreck. And the salvagers lived on um, Elliott Key. And then Key, um, Coconut Grove was our first community. Miami Beach was a concept. Somebody looked at it and said, I can do something with that. I can turn it into something. I can fill the swamp. I can build bridges. And they did. And even think about how it was done. We've all seen the pictures. They didn't use cranes and then use dump trucks. They used elephants. Think about the elephants. I mean, you've seen them in the zoo, but they used elephants. There's pictures of elephants carrying lots. Why? Because Miami Beach is a concept. And how do we get a railroad here? Julia Tubbs sent an envelope with an orange blossom to Henry Flagler in a winter that destroyed the orange crops in central Florida. That wasn't a financial reason to come here. It wasn't a business reason. It was an idea. It was a concept. Hey, it's still warm here, even though it's cold there. The ironic thing is that since we had the canker scare in Orlando, we don't have any orange trees here anymore, except for the couple of us that hid them when the guys came around with the chickens, right? I know each of you has a key line, but we don't, we don't talk about this. But it's a concept. So people came here, and they changed. First they came by trains, because Flagler built the train track. And then they came in their station wagons in the 1950s. And let's face it, back then, when people came here, the reason they came to Miami and Miami Beach was there was nowhere else to go. When you left the Northeast Corridor, you drove south. I mean, you could stop at uh, south of the border and buy fireworks. But there really wasn't anywhere else to go until you got there. But now, there's places to stop from Virginia Beach all the way down. Except people don't drive here anymore. 98% of our traffic these days comes in an airplane. And a lot of them land at Miami International, but about a third of them land at Fort Lauderdale. And if you ever fly southwest and you look at the... <coughs> now I know why you uh, said hello from Miami International. Hey, Mark. If you look in the Southwest magazine, where it says Fort Lauderdale, in parentheses it says Miami. Because people actually want to come here. They don't really want to go there. <laughs> why? Because... It's a concept. It's the concept of what people are going to find here. And so now we've created this incredible community, this incredible place. But here's the secret. We didn't create it. I know all of us in this room think we did. We built the buildings, by God. We paved the streets. We do the ads. But we don't create it. All those people who came, first in the trains, and then in the station wagons, and now in the airplanes, they created it. Because they sent back postcards. And those postcards, those images, were how other people created their view of our community. That's how they knew about Miami Beach, because they got a postcard. And then cameras became more and more popular, Instamatics and Browning cameras, and people sent back photos. And it's exactly the same today. The only thing that's happened is today it's a lot faster. Because today, we all have these. And we have an 8 megapixel camera within them. And so we take pictures of things, and then we do this. And we put it up on Facebook, and we put it on Twitter, and we put it on Flickr, and we do all those different things. And people get to see the concept, but they don't get to see it as we in the advertising business send it out. They don't get to see it as you in the development or hotel business send it out. They get to see it based on what our visitors see. And of course, we don't know where the future will go, but my guess is at some point, somebody will press their jaw, and the chip in their jaw will do something with their eye, and they will never <laughs> transmit the images. But it'll be the same thing. What people will send is this concept. And so who's created these images that they see? Well, certainly it's been our star architects, guys like Lapidus, and now we have, uh, we have the Herzog Garage, and we have the Gary Performing Arts Center, and we have Sir Norman Foster coming to build something here. And those people have created our image. And then we have, of course, the visionaries, the Carl Fishers, and uh, those folks who started our community. And then we have the hoteliers, the, the Musses, 
and those people, and of course we have the builders and the developers, Arkin and Turchin, my father, the people who actually built the buildings that are here, and then if we move into more modern times, we have guys like, uh, like Craig Robbins and Tony Goldman, and all these people who were telling the rest of the world <coughs> what's here. But again, it's this concept that we're telling. It's not the buildings. It's not the parks. It's not the beach. And by the way, people say, no, 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 no. They come here because of the weather. Well, that's true. Weather is our core competency. We do research every six months on why people come here. And weather, beaches, is always number one. But let's face it. Those of us who were here in the late 70s and the early 80s, we had the same weather. We had the same beautiful beaches. We had the same water. But people weren't coming because the concept was different. And if you remember the cover of Time Magazine, it said Paradise Lost. Well, the paradise was still here, the palm trees and the weather and the water, but the concept was lost. We had lost our way. And it's no surprise that we live in a community today that has the highest income zip code in the country, <coughs> Fisher Island, only three miles away from the lowest income zip code in the country, which is a place called Germ City, aptly named, and probably the ironically named Liberty City. How can you have those two things so close to each other? And the answer is because Miami Beach is a concept. And so what I would implore you, if I were able to write down what my goal is from this talk, what I want you all to take away, and understanding that you guys are all here to make your businesses better, the networking and the business opportunities that you get is all because of the chamber, all because of Miami Beach, all because of you're here, then what's the takeaway? To spend 10 minutes up here with you and be entertaining and funny? Okay, that's a good thing to do, but it's not enough. You guys came out, you ate breakfast, you spent money, you're going to have to wait for your cars at the end of the ballet. <laughs> what can I give you of value? And the bottom line, the bottom line, for improving your businesses, improving legislation on Miami Beach, improving our future, is not necessarily another building or another park or another anything. All those things are great, by the way, and I hope you all keep doing it. But the most important thing is to remember that the value of this community, the reason everyone in the world looks at Miami Beach and says, I want to be there, the reason, to go back to Jerry's earlier talk, that Best Buy, a company from Minnesota, you betcha, where it's a little colder than it is right here, the reason they want to do business with us, the reason they want to do business here, is because of the concept. And the concept is not something you can put your finger on. It's not something you can hold. It's not something you can touch. But it's something you can destroy almost overnight. If we don't respect, if we don't protect, if we don't promote what we have, then sooner or later another concept will take our place. The reason people want to come here is because it's bold and it's beautiful and it's colorful and it's wonderful and it's warm, but the bigger reason they want to come here is because of this idea that this is the greatest place in the world. It's the most incredible place in the world. We're lucky enough to live here. We don't always see it. We take it for granted. So I would beg you, I would implore you, as you build your businesses on Miami Beach, you never forget that the reason people come here is for the brand. And that you include the brand in all your marketing. You protect the brand with everything you do. And if you do that, the future is only brighter and brighter. Thank you very much. I think everyone will, will, will agree that that was uh, just an excellent presentation. Uh, my beach, past, present, and future. Um, and with the future in mind, with regard uh, with uh, regarding Miami Beach, um, we'd like uh, Bruce. I'd love to do a Q and A session oh, with sure. anyone in the group. Uh, you shouldn't stand up until someone actually has a question. There'll be, there'll be questions. Anyone? Jason usually has six. 
Well, I have a question, if no one else will, uh, will uh, speak. Well, I'll ask the first one. With regards to, as I mentioned a little earlier, gaming in Miami Beach, what's your views and take whatever neutral position you'd like to take? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of neutral positions. Uh, you know, it's funny, I was talking to my wife about this last night, and she said, wow, you've been doing the marketing for the Convention and Visitors Bureau for 20 years. You've written books on marketing. You do all this destination marketing. You know more about that than anyone. So there's going to be great questions. I said, no, all the questions are going to be about gambling. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I was right. Um, I have a couple opinions about this, which you all may or may not like, but they are my opinions. First of all, I think any of us who believe that gambling, we can either keep gambling from coming here or we can invite gambling to come here, I think we're kidding ourselves. Gambling's already here. We have internet cafes, we have this horrible word that someone invented, <coughs> racinos, or racinos, the racetracks that have gambling. We have paramutuals, we have gambling ships, we have cruise ships, and before we take the moral high ground, we have state-sponsored sponsor, state gambling with the lottery. And that's not even counting all the illegal, the numbers and all the other things that are going on. So that ship has already sailed. Wagering is here. Gambling is here. I don't think it's a question of scope. I think it's a question of scale. Does our brand need gambling? Absolutely not. We have the one of the most powerful brands in the world for destinations. We just did research, and the research showed that we are the fourth most uh, desired travel brand in the U.S. Number one, you all know it, it's Las Vegas. Have gambling, but I don't think that's the only reason. Las Vegas is number one, New York is number two, Orlando is number three, Miami is number four. Number five, and it's far down from us, is San Francisco, and then there's a bunch more. So our brand doesn't require it. Could it be helpful? As I, Jerry and I were discussing earlier, if properly regulated and incredibly taxed, I think it could. But I think the big issue is, how do we make it fit our community instead of the other way around? As I said, my entire talk was about the fact that Miami is a concept. If we allow gambling to become our concept, I think that would be a big mistake. And that's what's happened in Las Vegas. Gambling is the concept. They tried to become tourist friend, uh, family friendly. It didn't work. They're trying now to become a foodie destination, and it's working to some extent. But Las Vegas sells one thing. They sell sin. That's their brand. Sin. They don't have anything else to sin. And in fact, they've niched their brand. Because even though sin, in their case, is gambling, sin really, in, in Las Vegas, is adultery. I mean, look at their ads. What happens here stays here. <laughs> what are they talking about? <laughs> By the way, before you laugh, this has been done by lots of companies. One of our local companies, Burger King. Have it your way. You think they're talking about hamburgers? <laughs> we do work for Nike. Just do it. You think they're talking about sneakers? <laughs> if you do, you're kidding yourself. This is, this is not the issue. Las Vegas sells sin. It doesn't mean that's what you're going to do when you're there, but you could. <coughs> and before you laugh, I could ask, you don't have to do this, but raise your hands. How many of y'all have SUVs? Four-wheel drive, right? We live in Miami. We have no mountains, no snow, no dirt roads, no ice. Yet we drive four-wheel drive vehicles. Why? Because you could. And again, that's you know many of the, the women. I hate to be sexist, but many of the women in the room drive those. But let me make fun of the men. How many of y'all drive sports cars? Designed to go on the German Autobahn at 150 miles an hour? <laughs> we live in Miami. First of all, if you come here at any speed over 30 miles an hour, <laughs> you get a ticket from a guy that you then say thank you to. <laughs> and if you're the type of Miami Beach people, unlike my sister, who actually drive across the causeway, you're on 995, and if you're lucky, you can go 35 miles an hour. <laughs> In the lane, you pay extra money. To go. <laughs> but you could. He is funny. And so that's what happens in Vegas, and that's what could happen here. But the question is, how do we control it? It's not a matter of scope. It's a matter of scale. Mark.
Good morning, my name is Judy Holm, and I'm the Hi, founder Judy. of Aspirations Marketing and PR and a new transplant to Miami Beach via San Francisco, New York, and Paris. And I thank Jerry Levin and Jason Loeb for recently founding the Art and Culture Council of the Chamber of Commerce. And I wanted to address a question regarding your perception, speaking of branding, of how the art and culture scene is, of course, contributing to, I think, the absolute renaissance, if not naissance, of, of Miami Beach and how that blends in with the star architecture and some of the more traditional branding elements of Miami Beach. Sure. Um, the, the marketing that we did community-wise, you all might remember in 9-11, um, we had a, a, a terrible effect on our business here. 60% drop off in tourism overnight. And there was nothing wrong with our infrastructure. I mean, in the past, our tourism market went down when our infrastructure suffered. After a hurricane, people wouldn't come. Uh, when we had the crime issues, people wouldn't come. When Time Magazine did the Paradise Lost article, people didn't come. But at 9-11, nothing happened here, and yet 60% drop off overnight because people wouldn't fly. And that's when we completely changed the marketing of Miami and Miami Beach, and we started pushing really the South Beach image driving the train, the fashion forward concept, and I could talk on that for hours, but I'll spare you. Um, but a few years later, that was so successful that our ADR continued to rise and rise and rise and rise and rise until, let's face it, we were not offering a service product commensurate with the price we were charging. Because one thing that we don't have, and I'll say this out loud in this room or anywhere else, is we don't have a service product commensurate with the quality of our destination. We just don't. And we needed to change our visitors a little bit because the visitors who had come before couldn't afford the new price. And part of the way we do that always is to look at what's happening in the world. So when we did the fashion campaign, we had an ad that showed a woman who looked just like Tyra Banks, except she was much less expensive, in a uh, gold lame bikini standing on the, the rock jetty on First Street. That was our ad. And then in that same issue of Elle magazine, there was an 11-page spread titled Bling on the Beach, and it was actually Tyra Banks in metallic bikinis with giant jewelry laying on Miami Beach. And so people looked at it and they said, oh, you copied that from Elle. Well, it's kind of impossible to copy something that's in the same issue, right? Or they said, oh, they copied it from you. They copied your campaign. Well, unlikely, because it was in the same issue. Because it brought up this old marketing question. Does marketing mirror popular culture? Are we doing what's out there? Or does popular culture take its cues from marketing? And the answer is, I don't know. But it doesn't really matter as long as we can benefit from it. So we start looking at what's going on. And what we realize is the world is changing. And this arts and culture thing is going to be big. Now it's easy to say that. But it wasn't that easy to say that in 2004. Except what we saw was that Ian Schrager, who had hired Philippe Stark, to design the Delano, now hired Julian Schnabel to design his new hotel in New York. So you say, wait a second, he went from a designer, an interior designer of that, to an artist, a painter, to design a hotel. Something's going on here. And we looked at what our visionaries, the Tony Goldmans and the Craig Robbins and those people were doing, and they were buying art. And we looked at this new thing that had come here, Art Basel, which at first was not that big, but we realized something is going to change. So we changed the entire marketing campaign, and it was all about arts and all about culture. And the tagline was, express yourself. The idea being that you can come to Miami, you can come to Miami Beach, and you can do and be whoever you want. I mean, if you go to New York, and you dress in some wild way, with your hair, with your whatever, people don't care, and they don't look at you. But the re they actively don't look at you. <laughs> people in New York make an effort to look at you, because they're too damn cool to look at what you're doing. 